His lecture today is Non-Linear Elliptic Systems of Differential Equations and Geometrical Variations. Thank you very much. I'm very glad uh, that you came and uh, <coughs> Uh, you have not to be afraid that I will present to you high-flying ideas. I will be very down to earth. Uh, the topic, I thought of, I should explain to you something uh, very concrete and it should be also things I have been working on during the last few years. And uh, so I chose as topic uh, minimal surfaces. And uh, the main uh, topic of what I want to talk about is uniqueness. Of solutions. Uh, now everyone who is working with a nonlinear problem knows <coughs> that existence, if, if it may be uh, difficult or not difficult, usually uh, to say something about the number of solutions of a nonlinear problem uh, is the most difficult thing you can do. And so it's no wonder that not much is known about uniqueness uh, for solutions of boundary value problems for minimal surfaces. And before I start, uh, I should uh, make reference to some uh, literature, uh, some papers I have written together with my colleague Fritz Sauvigny. Uh, <coughs> it's uh, a paper in the Journal für Reine und Angewandte Mathematik from 1991, one paper in the Göttinger Nachrichten from 92, one paper in the Journal of the Mathematical Society of Japan from 1995. Uh, this will be particularly uh, on my mind. And then two forthcoming uh, papers uh, <coughs> on minimal surfaces in a wedge. Here I give the title. So it's uh, a wedge is uh, something like this. And then minimal surface which sit either in here or sit outside of this wedge. So that means uh, you have a free boundary then uh, which has a singularity, namely an edge. And uh, so you expect particular difficulties once you have uh, singularities on the boundary. And as a general reference, I give a book I have to written, have written with some students of mine, which I have quoted down here. It's Minimal Surfaces 1 and 2, appeared 1992 in the Grundlehren, volumes 295 and 96. So now I'm going to start. Uh, now let me talk, uh, first let me give the definition of minimal surface. Uh, minimal surfaces <coughs> are the stationary objects of the area function. So these are objects which make the first variation of area zero and as it is well known, if you have a regular surface satisfying this condition, then you get a differential equation, an Euler equation, and the Euler equation is the mean curvature zero. So the mean curvature zero is the Euler equation uh, connected with the area functional, and minimal surfaces are those surfaces uh, which have prescribed mean curvature zero. Uh, <coughs> Now, there are two lines. Uh, well, the old line is to look at minimal surfaces in a non-parametric way. That is, you describe a minimal surface as a function of uh, two real variables. So here's an xy plane, say a two-dimensional minimal surface, and uh, above this xy plane, you uh, describe surfaces as graphs of a certain function z. And uh, if uh, you want that such a surface is a minimal surface, then it has to satisfy the minimal surface equation, which is the following nonlinear differential equation, 1 plus c y squared z x x minus 2 c 2cx, cy, 
the second derivative xy plus 1 plus cx squared zyy y equals 0. So you have a quasi-linear partial differential equation of second order, <coughs> which is elliptic, but not uniformly elliptic, uh, only uniformly elliptic if you can bound the gradient. So it's on a solution, uniformly elliptic if the solution has bounded gradient, otherwise not. Uh, <coughs> so this is the oldest approach, and this is the equation which uh, Lagrange derived in uh, 1760-61. was quite an achievement because he uh, was able uh, to make variations of double integrals. Uh, what he could not do, uh, he could not uh, <coughs> derive the natural boundary conditions connected with this expression. That is, if you look at the area functional in non-parametric form, this is this expression, square root of 1 plus cx squared plus cy squared dx dy. <coughs> the natural boundary condition, which you get when you leave uh, the boundary values in part 3, or totally free, uh, you get only if you have something like uh, the divergence theorem and the first to derive this uh, this uh, natural boundary condition was uh, Gauss in his celebrated paper on capillary theory from 1830. Uh, and uh, Lagrange was not able to derive any solution of uh, this equation. Also Euler in his textbook had known already one. If Lagrange had looked in Euler's book, he had found that the, the catenoids, that means the surfaces of revolution of certain chain lines, are uh, minimal surfaces. And Meunier uh, <coughs> uh, was the one who rediscovered this solution, and he found a second minimal surface, namely the winding staircase. So if you have an, an axis, and you have a straight line uh, intersecting this axis perpendicularly and you move it up by a screw motion with constant speed, uh, then this axis which moves up uh, describes a minimal surface. This is the famous helicoid. Uh, <coughs> and this helicoid will soon play a certain role in, in some of my discussions. Uh, and then last century was uh, uh, more or less uh, people were occupied during the first half to find particular uh, solutions of the minimal surface equation. Uh, also Monge had already derived uh, a general procedure via characteristics uh, to set up uh, whole families of uh, minimal surface and actually uh, with a certain twist of this Weierstrass gave all descriptions of minimal uh, surfaces by means of pairs of holomorphic or meromorphic functions. Uh, <coughs> now these are the famous Weierstrass representation formulas. So in principle since the time of Weierstrass around uh, 1860 one knows all minimal surfaces. One can write them down uh, via triples of integrals formed by, uh, by certain expressions of arbitrarily given meromorphic functions. Uh, now, uh, this is uh, not very helpful in general. As Courant used to say, um, if you own all fish in the Rhine River, then uh, this doesn't help you very much. You have to catch the fish. Uh, now, uh, what you actually want to do is you want to solve certain boundary value problems and see what sort of uh, minimal surfaces you get as solutions. And the most celebrated problem is the so-called uh, plateau problem, named after the Belgium uh, 
Belgian physicist Plateau, uh, who made many experiments with soap films, and he discovered the fact that mm, not link, not knotted. Uh, but whatever uh, curve you, you, you uh, have, if it's not too large, then there are s certain instabilities coming in because then the weight of the soap film you want to spend in such a curve plays a certain role. Every curve bounds at least one minimal surface. And this was a challenging problem uh, for mathematicians uh, to prove every minimal, so every uh, given closed Jordan curve, that means every topological image of the unit circle uh, bounds at least one minimal surface. Well, and this problem was solved in 1930 by the American mathematician Jesse Douglas and by the Hungarian mathematician, independently by the Hungarian mathematician Tibor Rado. And uh, this problem was uh, generalized in many ways. Uh, for instance, what Jesse Douglas did, and for this he got the Fields Medal. If you have, uh, say, several boundary curves you want to span, uh, if certain sufficient conditions are satisfied. Uh, here you uh, can expect to have always solutions. If you have uh, 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 several curves, you cannot always expect a connected minimal surface sitting in such a boundary because you know already if you have two circles in parallel planes with the midpoint in a, on, a, on a common axis and uh, then the only minimal surface you can span in there are the catenoids. And these catenoids exist only if these two circles are sufficiently close to each other. If you're so already, as I have drawn it, it's too far apart. Uh, and then it shrinks in the center and breaks and goes over. This can be done very nicely in experiment, jumps into a disconnected minimal surface, namely into disks that always exist. And actually, this is uh, uh, was a please. Is there a singularity of the origin of those disks? I mean, where, where it broke is there. Uh, it it never goes down to the axis. It jumps already there. But okay, since you are asking, uh, this was a, a, an interesting problem, uh, namely Euler uh, had discovered that uh, you may have variational problems. Uh, at that time, one expected one has a solution of a variational problem, and uh, then it has to satisfy a certain differential equation. And to find out whether it's a minimum or maximum, you just test. You choose an arbitrary other surface, and of if the value of the functional in this other surface is larger, well, then it was a minimum. If it's smaller, then it's a maximum. Uh, that is obviously not the right way to do, but uh, that's, that's what Euler assumed. Uh, amazingly, for a Swiss mathematician, is that uh, he did not think of stationary uh, surfaces, but uh, what he discovered was that you might have singular solutions. Namely, if you take, for instance, this integral, and this is uh, similar to the integral uh, what you have for minimal surface in revolution. Uh, it turns out clearly you have a singularity at where x is zero of the, the integrand. And uh, what Euler found out, the absolute minimum under given boundary conditions is not anymore a smooth surface, but is a broken line, a polygon. And you see this very clearly here. Namely, if you general, if you form it appropriately, it's exactly this broken line which comes up. And if you rotate this broken line, well, you get two disks, 
and you get a, a certain threat, which in nature cannot dis uh, exist. So the soap film lets this uh, straight line disappear, and you have just two disks. That is actually the absolute minimum. And uh, <coughs> uh, Gauss uh, was aware of this uh, paper of Euler, and he formulated as a price question in Göttingen University in 1830. And, uh, this price question was answered by Mr. Goldschmidt, who of course found this solution and discussed it. And since that time, it's a, a famous solution. And it's the first time that so-called broken extremals, that means non-smooth uh, solutions of or minimizers of variational problems, of seemingly regular variational problems, uh, come into the play. <coughs> Well, this depends. Uh, this depends with uh, variational problems. You see, uh, for the old physicist, it was not a priori given what a solution should be. There was the problem. And once there was the problem, you had to find what you mean by solution. And this is actually still the problem nowadays. Uh, oh, okay, I come to that. Uh, I, I come back to this. Uh, <coughs> So, uh, mathematicians have learned with, with this kind of problems uh, what should be a solution, uh, uh, which way should you set up boundary value problems, and so on. <coughs> now, what uh, I have made a detour, what I wanted to say is uh, this was, so to say, the old way of talking about minimal of the very old way. But then, is a, a semi-classical way, which was introduced by Weierstrass. And uh, I, of course, will not go the whole, uh, the whole history, will not pass through the whole history, so I call, speak about the semi-classical uh, solutions. And then <coughs> this will be uh, the notion of a solution I want to use. And secondly, uh, <coughs> there is the notion of a solution in the sense of geometric measure theory. Now, this is, so to say, the most uh, modern thing. Uh, the objects you have are certain measures, and these measures concentrate really regular at many parts, and then you might have singularities. So you have objects which look like this. Uh, can be very complicated, uh, the things which turn up. One really has to look at specific problems to see that this are, is a very uh, reasonable notion. And, uh, <coughs> but here uh, you are not able to describe the topological type of solutions. While in the semi-classical approach, uh, you prescribe a priori the topological type of the parameter domain on which the solutions should exist. So whatever solutions you get, you have already some information of the topological nature of these solutions. So this is out for me, and uh, I come <coughs> to the semi-classical solutions. So let me look for convenience at surfaces uh, three-dimensional surfaces defined on two-dimensional parameter set. In general, you should write instead of B uh, a Riemann surface or uh, actually, there are even non-orientable minimal surfaces. As the, there are minimal surfaces of the type of a Möbius strip. So uh, even Riemann surfaces are not enough as parameter domains. Uh, but what I have to say, uh, here I choose uh, domains which are conformally equivalent uh, to the disk. So my parameter domain will be either the disk or the half disk, whatever problem I'm considering. Uh, <coughs> Now, 
Such a surface is then depends on two parameters, uh, which I usually will write in a complex way as u plus e y in b, and sometimes b is thought to be in R2, or sometimes I identify it with c. So that's a certain sloppiness in my notation, which I hope you forgive me. And uh, so this is a mapping consisting of three variables <coughs> and I assume assume for the moment that this mapping for the moment just that this is a regular mapping so a regular surface in immersion uh, say at least of class C2 uh, C2 immersion and uh, <coughs> Uh, assume that the surface is given in conformal parameters, uh, which you, for a sufficiently nice surface regular, you can always introduce locally conformal parameters by Lichtenstein's theorem and globally using the uniformization theorem. So for the moment, this is no uh, restriction. Conformal parameters means in Gauss notation E equals G and F equals zero, or if I write it down, E is the length squared of X sub U, G is the length squared of X sub V, and X U times X V scalar product zero. So these are the conformality relations. Now, if you have a regular surface and uh, have the surface uh, represented in such conformal parameters, then if you form the Laplacian of X, this is the ordinary Laplacian, Laplace X equals X sub U U plus X sub V V. So this vector consisting of the Laplacian applied to each component of X, then it turns out this, this vector is in proportion to the normal vector xu vector product with xv. And there's a proportionality factor which I call 2h, which of, of course depends on u and v. And since I have assumed that it's an immersion, it turns out this h here is the mean curvature. That is, if I have a surface given in conformal parameters, then it's a minimal surface. So x is minimal surface if and only if Laplace x equals zero. So minimal surfaces in this notation are triples of harmonic functions representing uh, uh, regular surfaces and satisfying uh, these uh, two nonlinear equations. Uh, now this is the wonderful trick that also uh, the minimal surface equation is highly nonlinear. If you introduce uh, conformal parameters, you get to a linear equation, but not quite. I mean, you have these nonlinear side conditions and actually, in all the problems one is going to consider, one has nonlinear boundary conditions. And nonlinear boundary conditions with a linear equation are as good as a non-linear uh, equation with linear boundary conditions locally. So as soon as you maybe apply to the surface a diffeomorphism, you straighten it out, and then you get a new surface which uh, looks like uh, something of this type. If uh, Z is the uh, diffeomorphism applied uh, to X, so gamma is something uh, which I form from the Christoffel symbols. And this is typical uh, for many equations in differential geometry. Uh, that you have uh, is of linear or semi-linear, a uh, semi-linear or, or quasi-linear type. Here, even the, the leading part is rather nice. But then you have a non-linearity, which is quadratic, 
in the first derivatives. This is just the bad case or good case, as you like. Uh, less uh, nonlinear than quadratic would be easy. Uh, of higher nonlinearity would in general create very bad problems. This is a borderline case. And this borderline case uh, makes everything fascinating. So this is not a specialty, but this is the right thing to consider. Uh, <coughs> Now, uh, just to give you uh, an idea. Uh, what also can happen or what one uh, for certain reason about which I will talk in a minute uh, has to consider. This is say, let's take the surface norm, the so-called Gauss map. This is the unit normal on the surface, uh, which you also could write this normalization factor, which is the length of this vector, as eg minus f squared, square root out of it. So n is then a mapping of the parameter to vein into the unit sphere sitting in R3. If x satisfies a certain differential equation, also n should satisfy a certain differential equation. And it's uh, well known that if x satisfies either this equation or this equation with constant h, uh, then the mapping n, the Gauss map, is a harmonic map of b into the S2. Uh, that is now you have, of course, uh, a restriction. You have to satisfy uh, n equals 1. <coughs> so you have not any more Laplace n being 0, as would be for a no, uh, normal harmonic map. But it's a harmonic map in the S2. So the system is of this type. Minus Laplacian n equals n times gradient n squared. Uh, <coughs> so this holds even for surfaces of constant mean curvature. For minimal surface, you have an, an, an bonus, an extra bonus, namely n. If x is given in conformal parameters, also n is given. Is given in conformal parameters, and. Uh, if K is the Gauss curvature, Gauss curvature of X, then you have the following relation. Gradient N squared is uh, <coughs> 2E. E is this uh, expression uh, over here. Uh, times k. Of course, the sign is not right. Minimal surface, you have the, the, the average of the principal curvature is zero, so the product of the principal curvatures should be non-positive. Uh, so k is a non-negative, non-positive number. And this is a non-negative, so a minus sign. So this is correct. And uh, since we have conformal parameters, uh, then E is equals W. And so it turns out that the Dirichlet integral of the Gauss map equals the expression so minus k is absolute value of k, 
And then there comes uh, E times du dv. This is the area element. So this is the total curvature over the surface. So uh, we discover the total curvature of a minimal surface is the Dirichlet integral of its Gauss map. Uh, this is a link. Uh, now, if you want to do something on minimal surface, and say you let boundaries move, and then you want to see how the solutions move, then it's usually not enough uh, that one considers just the minimal surface, but one should always take along uh, the normal map. So one should study together x and n. And if instead of minimal surfaces you st study other uh, surfaces described by certain geometric properties, then of course you will have other equations than this one. Nevertheless, you will derive these equations. And then you have two sets of equations. And then you have to study always these pairs x and n together if you want to have really geometrical uh, uh, statements about a minimal surface x. So the secret is, not a big secret, but uh, it is something which you already, which you do not yet find in the work of Erhard Heinz, whom I consider as genius uh, in this domain, and who has made the greatest progress during the 50s, 60s, and 70s on uh, uh, <coughs> two-dimensional elliptic systems uh, of this or related type, uh, but from his student Fritz Sauvigny, with whom I have written these papers, I learned that it's very good uh, to consider this always together. Now, uh, I still haven't answered uh, your question, uh, what I mean with minimal surface uh, solving Plateau's problem. Uh, namely, you now expect if I say Plateau's problem has been solved, uh, that one really has found regular solutions solving the problem. Uh, this is not true. Uh, what uh, Douglas and Radeau did is they found generalized solutions in the sense uh, that is allowed that E equals zero. So the singular points, what are the singular points? The singular points are those where you don't have a real tension plane. That is where xu is in proportion to xv. And since we are we want to look at surfaces given in conformal parameters, the only possible singularities are those where E is equal to zero. It means uh, where uh, E, F, G, all three are zero. These are the so-called branch points. And now uh, you can represent every minimal surfaces, surface, according to Weierstrass, locally as real parts of uh, three holomorphic functions. So they are holomorphic curves. And these curves uh, satisfying uh, the property that x phi w phi w uh, equals zero. I forgot what is the, the word for this. Uh, if a certain quadratic form is made zero, <laughs> well, whatever. So there's uh, certain geometric expressions uh, ge geometers like to use uh, for this. So these are particular holomorphic curves in three-dimensional complex space uh, of which minimal surfaces are the real parts. And, uh, <coughs> and uh, one admits one admits singularities, then it turns out you have a certain singular points, they are called branch points, and it turns out these branch points are, uh, in these branch points, a minimal surface behaves just in the same way as a holomorphic function uh, behaves in a, in a branch point. Uh, so you can write down via Taylor series asymptotic expansions. Uh, and they are there. 
And what one knew after uh, Jesse Douglas and Rado's work was one has had this generalized solution and to describe how they got their solutions. Uh, you look at Dirichlet's integral, xu squared plus xv squared, du dv. You look at the area functional, and uh, standard inequality, you have always A is less than Dirichlet's in integral, and you have equality if and only if the surface you are considering is almost everywhere conformally parameterized. That means uh, these uh, solutions, uh, or these equations have to be satisfied almost everywhere. Now, uh, nowadays you would just take uh, if you want to minimize this in a certain class of boundary conditions, you would take surfaces defined on B with values in R3, R3, which have generalized first derivatives which are square integrable. So this would be the admissible surfaces. And then you wanted uh, to minimize uh, A. But minimizing A is a bad thing because A uh, has too, too much freedom. Uh, for instance, uh, stationary points of A are disks, but as well a hair on a disk, or two hairs on a disk, or many hairs on a disk. This uh, surface area doesn't feel. Of course, if you do not uh, prescribe that the, the elements you want uh, to admit a priori are regular surfaces. Now, but that doesn't make sense. Uh, if you want to work in a Sobolev space, it doesn't make sense to assume that the, uh, W formed from X is positive always everywhere. So you see, uh, these are bad objects and uh, you have to cut the hairs off, as Hilbert called it, to get the real nice smooth minimizer. And uh, to cut the hairs off, this is done very elegantly by moving from A to the Dirichlet integral. So instead of minimizing A, you minimize Dirichlet's integral. And then you have a double bonus. First of all, you can make variations of the dependent variables. Then you get Euler's equations. And Euler's equations of Dirichlet integral are just the equations Laplace and x equals 0. But then you can vary the independent variables. You can uh, deform. You don't see it upstairs in, on the surface. You just change the representation. And uh, if you do this, uh, you get differential equations and boundary conditions, which are a special case of uh, Euler's, uh, of Eminöter's uh, famous theorem. And uh, if you look what it means in this case, it means uh, conformality. So minimizing Dirichlet's integral gives you, if you can do it, gives you a double bonus. It gives you surfaces which are harmonic and at the same time uh, satisfied conformality relations. However, you still have these singularities. Uh, they cannot be everywhere or not even dense. They must be discrete within B because we have these branch point expansions and from the branch point expansions you see they must be discrete inside. They could cluster only at the boundary. So this was about the status of a 1930. One knew nothing uh, concerning uh, one knew nothing concerning the branch points, and uh, one knew nothing about the boundary uh, behavior of these minimal surfaces. It was proved uh, in a series of papers that if 
x is a minimal surface uh, it's a class of admissible surfaces and the class of admissible surfaces are surfaces z uh, which are in h12 and uh, if they are in H12, they have a Zobolev trace on the boundary, which is at least L2, even better. And uh, then this uh, trace, which I just a little bit sloppy write as boundary values of Z, uh, these boundary values are assumed to be continuous. monotonic. So uh, here you have say a parameter domain B, here you have a gamma and you have surfaces uh, X which have here uh, a nice continuous trace and they map these boundary points into boundary points in a continuous way. However, monic monotonic in a weekly uh, in a weekly monotonic way, it can happen. You admit this that the whole interval is mapped into one point. So it's so to say limits of topological mappings are admitted. The reason is again that you can apply the direct methods of the calculus of variations. And then it turns out you still have too much inside such a space. So uh, usually one adds uh, a three-point condition, which I write as a star over here. The directly integral is invariant under conformal mappings. This is you, you divide out a conformal group, and to divide out a conformal group, this you do in a way that behind every x you uh, put a suitable conformal self-mapping of the unit, unit disk such that three given points are mapped into three given points on the prescribed boundary of the arc. And in this sense, uh, the solution was found. The solution was found. It's then real analytic in the interior. In fact, it turns out the solution one gets this way is of the class H12, same class as here, and is continuous up to the boundary. Uh, then, of course, you ask yourself if the boundary gamma is nice, say CS or CS alpha or C infinity or real analytic, is the solution as nice? The answer is yes, it is. Uh, if you want to do this, then one possible way is uh, you straighten out the boundary locally, you pass from this linear system I have written here uh, to a certain non-linear system, and then you get a kind of boundary conditions. These are uh, two Dirichlet and one Neumann type boundary condition, but coupled with each other. And uh, you have to juggle uh, with these boundary conditions. But this is a story which is uh, long closed uh, and is uh, described in our book, so I will not go into the detail. So please uh, keep in mind, uh, if the boundary is nice, the solution is nice. So at least from the analytical point of view, you have something reasonable up to the boundary. But it's still not reasonable in the differential geometric sense. This was a result proved by several people. It started with a famous paper by Robert Ossermann. And Ossermann uh, had quite an ingenious idea uh, with which he thought he could show that minimizer of Dirichlet's integral have no branch points in the interior. Well, it turned out there was a flaw in the paper. There were also flaws in some succeeding papers. And uh, only very recent, recently uh, a student from 
uh, München, who is now assistant in Bonn, Daniel Wienholz has removed, let's say, all the difficulties. Uh, but of course, the main ideas are Osserman, Guy Lever, Alt. Uh, and what about the boundary? Well, it turns out one could remove uh, the branch points at the boundary uh, if the boundary is real analytic. If the boundary is not real analytic, it's not known up to date. And there are very ugly examples put up by Gulliver, uh, which show you it's a, it's a real subtle question, uh, which also needs some algebra and uh, to decide. And uh, Wienholz, in his dissertation, uh, which is now written, uh, has derived certain criteria which exclude uh, boundary branch points, but it's far from uh, having settled the question. It uh, seems to be uh, an exceedingly difficult and technically difficult question, and it's the difficulty it comes not from just from insufficient technique, but this Gulliver example tells you uh, it is in the matter of the material that is complicated uh, to remove these things. So what we can say this minimizes at least the are reasonable objects, even in the differential geometric sense, except for the boundary. So at the boundary, you might have problems. Uh, one can estimate the number of branch points, and this one can do via Gauss-Bonnet theorem, and this integral, of course, plays a certain role, plus the total curvature of the boundary curve. And uh, if the total curvature of the boundary curve is finite, you can prove you have only finitely many branch points in the interior and at the boundary. So these uh, geometrically unpleasant things, there are only finitely many. And you can even estimate them in geometric terms, how many there can be at most of them. So these are the objects which I call uh, minimal surfaces. Uh, <coughs> now, uh, then Courant has considered, as well as other people, but Courant gave uh, general solutions. Uh, say you have a surface S and an arc gamma with endpoints on S, but otherwise completely outside, and you want to minimize area of surfaces sitting in such a configuration. So the surface has part of its boundary over here. You can imagine this, that we describe this in the following way. Uh, this part of the boundary is maybe mapped weakly monotonically onto this. Oh, I forgot to say, once you have the solution, which is in the first only weakly monotonic, it's automatically strictly monotonic and therefore topological. So this is not very difficult to prove. Uh, and this part of the boundary here, this blue part, is mapped into some curve over here. Now, I would like uh, to say once S and gamma is nice, then the minimal surface sitting in such a configuration, except for these two points, which somehow corresponds to these two points, the minimal surface is nice. It's true with certain uh, precautions, but you have to be careful. And that you really have to be careful, I would like to draw an example, uh, which is due to current. It's a heuristic example which some uh, Chinese student of mine, Mr. Chen, has made precise. And uh, it's roughly like this. To produce uh, a configuration consisting of a surface S and an R gamma, uh, which is C infinity, the surface, but has an unbounded trace, uh, I proceed the following way. Now, so assume, just for your orientation, I have here a straight line, and then I draw a line like this. Uh, 
should be symmetric. Haven't quite achieved it. So think of it that it uh, narrows exponentially. And then I start to dig. So in here, I go with my shuffle and dig out a ditch, but of varying depths. And I show you how the ditch looks like at different heights. So say over here in the middle, there is this widest. Let, let's suppose that it looks like this. Over here, I let, let it look like this. Over there, uh, so it gets uh, less deep and less deep, this ditch. At the very end, there is no ditch anymore. Uh, I can even smooth it out later so that it becomes C infinity. Think that I have done this. And the ditch is done in such a way that the length of this curve compared with the width of the ditch, uh, so length divided by width tends to infinity, even here. So this gets smaller, but this also gets much smaller. And now think of a minimal surface. Uh, I draw a minimal surface. Uh, as, uh, I draw an arc which has its endpoints here. And so the arc goes like this. In projection is this. So I take this curve and like, a, uh, like an arch, I put it over here. Now, the word of minimal surface that wants to minimize area would do first is it goes down there. Uh, it goes down very much. Maybe I should have drawn it more convincingly. It goes down very much. It's a lot of area. Uh, compared with the area, if I had drawn this smaller here, Comparing this area with this area, if I have arranged it correctly, going down is much more area than going to the side. So the minimal surface goes to the side, tests it here again, goes down, it's more area than the rest of the arc, if I have arranged it appropriately. So that might convince you why a minimal surface might just disappear at infinity, so you get it, an unbounded trace. And this you can make precise, uh, such a type of argument. Uh, so that clearly you need a condition about smoothness of the supporting surface in infinity. But if you do this, uh, well, uh, then it functions. And then, in fact, uh, you get for solutions uh, which minimize uh, Dirichlet's integral in such a configuration, you get a minimal surface, which is a real minimizer, uh, satisfies the conformality relations, is nice over here, nice over here. So, and uh, you can make similar statements about the branch points, as I had uh, said before, and this is okay. Now, uh, today it seems I get only to the point that I formulate the problem. Uh, what I want to talk about. Now, what about the uniqueness? Uh, it is not very much known about uniqueness. For Plateau's problem, of Plateau's problem, one has basically two, two uniqueness results. Uh, the first is due to Thibaudot, 
uh, and goes back to a little problem. The technique he uses is a little problem, a uh, very interesting problem that was uh, posed by Oado and solved by Helmut Kneser. Uh, it is Lösung der Aufgabe 41. Jahresberichte der DMV 1926, 1926. Uh, it's the following beautiful uh, problem that had been raised by Rado. Think of a disk. Think of a convex set in the plane. Think of a harmonic mapping from the disk so this convex set K so a harmonic map uh, means you have two functions and each component satisfies Laplace in equal zero uh, and assume that the mapping F restricted to the boundary of the disk gives a mapping from this boundary to the boundary of the convex set. And suppose that this mapping is a topological mapping. A one-to-one -one mapping, a homeomorphism. So the mapping is a homeomorphism from the boundary to the boundary. The maximum principle tells you then, of course, that the interior is mapped into the interior. Uh, this is easy. Uh, the question, and that question had been solved, is this mapping a homeomorphism and inside the domain a diffeomorphism? The answer is yes. Now, this is a beautiful uh, prototype of a problem which you can, of course, generalize. You have a certain system of mappings from domains in R2 to domains in R2, satisfying certain elliptic uh, equations like those, uh, say harmonic or others, which come up like in the monk ampere question. They have been studied, for instance, by Erhard Heinz. Uh, <coughs> and assume that the boundary is mapped topological to the boundary. Can you prove that those mappings are diffeomorphisms? Uh, so this uh, first step is you have to estimate the Jacobian determinant from below. And this is a great achievement uh, that Erhard Heinz has done as the first for such systems. But the beginning of the whole theory is this little problem. And the main step is, of course, an estimate. It's not yet an estimate in the answer of, uh, of Helmut Kneser. It's, uh, he showed that the Jacobian is positive or negative, depending on which way you have made the orientation. And uh, using uh, this, this result, Rado was able to prove the following result. <coughs> if in R3 you have a, a curve gamma which possesses a convex projection to the boundary of a planar domain, and uh, Rado had to assume it's one to one by a different technique, uh, Johannes uh, Nietzsche could even admit that you have uh, vertical pieces. So uh, like a, a graph which somehow has been turned vertical so that over certain points you have vertical parts which project to one point, which is interesting if, for instance, you have boundaries of of this type. You can imagine the polygonal boundaries which have vertical pieces and you want to find whether there is uh, only one minimal surface sitting inside. So Rado's theorem is if gamma uh, 
it sits like a graph or like a generalized graph over the boundary of a convex domain, of a strictly convex domain. Uh, then there's only one minimal surface of the type of the disk. There is one, one proofs, but there's only one. So this is a uniqueness result for disk type uh, minimal surface. And there's a similar result with slightly different technique, which doesn't work with orthogonal projection, but works with central projection, also proved by Rado. And there's a second uh, uniqueness result. Uh, so this is from 1932, I think, and this result is from about 1970 by Johannes Nietzsche. And Nietzsche proved that if you have a boundary curve such that uh, the total curvature is less than 4 pi, there exists only uh, one minimal surface inside. And the idea uh, is like this. This work goes via the second variation. The idea is like this. Uh, assume you had two minimal surfaces uh, sitting in a curve gamma, satisfying this condition. And this boundary uh, uh, satisfies this condition. Then it turns out by looking at the second variation that you really have strict minima. It's a certain type of field construction which uh, Nietzsche carried out here. Uh, but once you have two minima, there is this topological theorem coming from Morse theory, which uh, for minimal surfaces at that time had not been proved, but uh, a special result had been proved due to Gorant. There's always a saddle point sitting somewhere between the two minima. And this saddle point is not a minimum, definitely not a minimum. But every minimal surface sitting in a boundary curve satisfying this condition must be a minimum. So this should also be a minimum. So you have a contradiction. So there can be only two minimal surfaces. This is uh, the idea of Nietzsche. Now you might think you uh, quantize six, six pi, two solutions, eight pi, three solutions or so. But it turns out this is a result of oh, beautiful examples by uh, Reinhold Böhme, 10 or 15 years ago proved. Uh, for every epsilon, you can find a, an every epsilon positive and every uh, integral n. You can find a curve gamma with total curvature less than 4 pi plus epsilon, which has the property that in the curve gamma there sit at least n minimal surfaces. So there is no hope uh, to restrict the number <laughs> of solutions uh, in any way from uh, uh, this geometrical quantity. Now, uh, what I would like uh, to prove is a uniqueness result for uh, partially free boundary value problems, as I had described it over here. And let me please just state uh, the, the problem, and the next time I talk about the result, I can prove and give some ideas how the proof will function. <coughs> So in a plane, I give a curve sigma, and I give another curve, uh, which I go, call gamma bar, uh, which has endpoints on this curve sigma, and this little arc in here in between I call no, sorry, I call this sigma naught, this I call sigma. So sigma is this part. And I assume that here I have a simply connected domain and that gamma is convex with respect to this uh, domain G. While I make no convexity assumption over here, though this curve might really look like this. This other curve gamma bar here should be convex with respect to G. And now uh, I form a cylinder surface 
So I draw at each point, here I draw the normal. So there I have a surface S. And over this uh, arc, there sits this, I assume, sits another arc, uh, gamma, uh, that uh, sits as a graph over here. So you can imagine gamma is an, is an arc which has two gamma bar, a uh, one-to-one -one projection. So uh, if, we, if it would close, the assumption would be the same as in Radoz theorem. Uh, now I want to span a minimal surface which has its free part of its boundary on the surface S, on this cylinder surface, and uh, has a prescribed boundary over here. Remember, these are not directly boundary conditions. Uh, if I require that the admissible surfaces map this onto the yellow arc and this somewhere into here, uh, I'm not saying this point goes in this and this point into this. I just say this image here, this curve is a monotonic image of this arc. But how the surface does it, this uh, I leave to the surface. It's like a curtain which goes on rolls and how it rolls, where it pushes together, where it goes uh, apart, this I leave to the surface. Now, uh, I get a solution. The question is, uh, uh, is the solution unique? And do I get, as in Radeau's theorem, the solution as a graph? Uh, the answer is no. Not even if this arc is convex. Uh, I draw you an example. I take a cylinder, a circular cylinder. And then I take the cylinder axis, and then, then I draw a semi-diameter from here to the cylinder axis, and then I draw another semi-diameter uh, and the projections down here. The projection of the cylinder to the plane is this circle. This arc is projected to this arc. This arc, the vertical one, goes just to one point. And this arc goes to this point. So now uh, you might think, if I want to span a minimal surface into this configuration, which is stationary in there. So stationary means, of course, it has not just to satisfy the differential equation, but also the free boundary condition. And free boundary condition means wherever it meets the cylinder surface, it has to meet it perpendicularly. So this is the generalization. If you have a, a free arc and a point, and you want to draw the shortest line, then the shortest line meets perpendicularly. If you do the same with minimal surfaces, then the free boundary condition is perpendicularity. Uh, now, do you have uh, a solution which is parametrized over this and is like a graph over this? Yes. You just take a helicoid with a quarter turning. So think of a staircase which makes just a quarter turning up here. Uh, so this is from here. You go to this upper floor by one quarter turning, very steep uh, stair. So it would be uh, sit as a graph over here. But you can do the same, of course, like this. Okay. Uh, and so you get denumerably many solutions. Helicoids. So no chance. Satisfy the boundary condition, satisfy the differential equation. So uh, this is uh, certainly not all that I assume 
that the projection of the boundary configuration down to the plane is strictly convex. This is not all. This does not guarantee uniqueness. Uh, I have to add other conditions. And the other conditions uh, we have to add, they look uh, technical, but I will, I hope to convince you next time they are really very close to the truth. As soon as these uh, conditions are violated, uh, there are more solutions. So this I leave to the next time and then I will uh, show you uh, how I proceed to get a, so in addition to this assumption, I have to add another as assumption. Doing this, I can prove uniqueness. And this is a nice uh, application of theory of partial differential equations, as you will see. Thank you. Yes. Uh, it is so. Uh, to estimate the number of branch, uh, there are always, in general, there are always branch points. It's very easy. You take just uh, two ho uh, holomorphic functions which have the right sort of branch points and you generate a minimal surface. So there are uh, branch points. And it's unavoidable. And those you can estimate. You, ca you can. Uh, you can uh, prevent branch points from appearing by assuming that the minimal surfaces are minimizing the Dirac integral. So the true minimizers have no interior branch points. This is the Gulliver Osserman Alt theorem with some uh, uh, technical extras uh, of Wienholz. So the, I should not give a wrong idea. So these are the real uh, res people who proved the results. Uh, yes. Uh, is it the method of constructing this counter examples? Uh, is it local or local? I mean, is it possible uh, if you have a good curve slow curvature to perform the transmission of this curvature to get the uh, wrong Yes, uh, uh, this is a result by, there's an example constructed uh, by Fritz Tomey and, and a student of his. Uh, if you look at our book, uh, chapter four, in the, there we have always school, yeah? Then you see oh, very strange curves topologists have invented. Uh, I cannot draw them. Uh, these are curves uh, which have, have intriguing properties. So they, you pull them from the plane a little bit apart. And uh, these curves have the property to give uh, non-uniqueness, if I remember correctly. But they have, mo just a moment, but they have a lot of curvature, the bound. Then the, they are just, uh, devi they deviate just a little bit from a planar curve but have a lot of curvature because they go around. No, well, this is also a but uh, I was asking about this. Um, you have a curve with curvature less than 4 pi, and you talk a little bit in, in a small piece, you get 4 pi plus 6, so then you get non -beliefs. Uh Well, the, the way how to generate minimal surfaces is a very complicated. Just, just think, uh, minimal surfaces are real parts of holomorphic functions. And with holomorphic functions, you have very strange approximation properties. There are these results of Beckert, that if you have a domain and you have solutions of differential equations, then you can mod uh, modify your solutions very much. You can bring it to the neighborhood of whatever you want by just modifying a little bit on a most tiny part of the boundary. So, because this is very stiff, being holomorphic, I mean, once you uh, move a little bit on the boundary, you can create everything.
on the tiniest parts of the boundary, you can create all sorts of, of surfaces. So uh, the influence from a tiny change at the boundary, the global influence is, uh, is not at all predictable. That would be beautiful if one could do this, but uh, I think no one has an idea how one ca could make such a prediction. Uh, one of the first papers uh, by Korn. I think it's uh, in this uh, celebration volume that German mathematicians had written for Hermann Amandus Schwarz around the beginning of this century. There's a paper by Korn uh, where he uh, gives two applications of the method of successive approximations. Well, Banach theorem. We are C two alpha estimates, which at that time Korn had just uh, well uh, pulled out out of uh, Hölder's ideas on the uh, Newtonian potential. And using these uh, estimates, Korn was able uh, to do things of the sort. If you have a, in the domain, you have a convex curve, then of course you have a minimal surface sitting inside. It's just a flat domain. And then if you make sufficiently small changes of the boundary, uh, you get solutions of the non-parametric minimal surface equations. So this is what Korn proved. So this is a kind of perturbation theorem. Is it, what are you doing this, this I don't know. I think uh, I think yeah I no I cannot answer. Uh, it might be so that the result is even true up to four pi might be. but this I do not remember anymore. This argument, this argument, no, there, there you are in a limit case, and I do not remember anymore. It, this is a, compl is a complicated thing. Uh, to, to make this field construction, what are you doing? You look at the Jacobi operator of the, so the linearization uh, of the quadratic term. Of the, of the functional. And if you are in the limit case, this is something like if I, th uh, what could happen is that you, pro it's probably what could happen is that you are like in the case, uh, this I do not remember correctly, but th that you have the, for the normal filling a whole semi-sphere. And so you are just in the limit case where depending on how you write down your eigenvalue, that the eigenvalue is zero. Instead of being positive, it's zero for the second variation. That means for your Jacobi operator, you are just in the singular case. It were a little bit positive, you could uh, take the inverse, and, and from this you could, uh, by the method of successive uh, approximations, you, you could build up your field. The idea is here you have the minimal surface, you embed it in a field of of neighboring uh, minimal, minimal surfaces. Uh, so, so to say the Weierstrass idea that Hermann Schwarz had carried out for minimal surfaces in this famous paper uh, on Weierstrass's birthday, 1885, uh, where he introduced the minimum characterization of the smallest eigenvalue of an elliptic operator. All these beautiful things are there. There he did his field construction. And that, that is what Nietzsche has taken. And uh, so, uh, so what you first have to show that that you sit here in a real in a real ditch, in a real minimum. Otherwise, Courant's theorem doesn't function. You must have two real local minima. One does not know whether for minimal surfaces things like this may happen. You see, if you <coughs> write here the area or the directly integral and here you write the surfaces it might look like like this and then you have a, a, a whole valley 
so you have a, a whole continuum of minimal surfaces and then it goes up again. Uh, no one is able to disprove uh, that such things uh, can happen, assuming that something is right, say like boundary real analytic. Also, if you would do such things, uh, one could prove many other nice results. So this is a one unknown question uh, to which already uh, Courant and Schiffman had put their finger, but no progress has been made in that. Thank you very much.